This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 169. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's guest is Nick Devley of Glassroots Trade Show. We are discussing up-and-coming trade show coming to us in Madison, Wisconsin, August 10th and 11th. Uh, you hear me mention them all the time as they are a sponsor on our show, and uh, definitely like to keep in touch with these guys as they are one of my uh, favorite people out there in terms of the trade show circuits. And uh, we cover all kind of topics here in terms of uh, the saturation or oversaturation per se, or just the craziness going on in the trade show community and all the trade shows every freaking once a month or twice a month, you got something going on. Uh, the struggles he's had to deal with, with being sandwiched in between dates and trade shows. Uh, we talk about the ideas and concepts of being fully prepared to get to the shows themselves. If you're new at doing a trade show, or if you're a veteran at doing trade shows, how you can tweak things and sell your work and a lot of really good conversation and topics and a little, uh, you know, just kind of political talk about what's going on. And uh, Nick is not afraid to express himself and share his opinion on things. So we definitely had a lot of fun on this talk and I'm glad to get him back on. Um, and for all those out there, I just want to put this out there. I'm going to be going to Glassroots this year. Uh, my daughter and I are going to be at a wedding in Kentucky on the 9th and then the 10th and the 11th will be up in Madison. Um, I'm going to have a room there for interviews. So if you're going to Glassroots, and I am 100% for sure going this year, um, hit me up, uh, email wiseguymedia at gmail.com, at W-Y-Z-G-U-I media at gmail.com. I'll have a link in the show notes for you um, if you'd be interested in sitting face-to-face and doing an interview. Um, we're going to be doing some video work up there, really helping promote Glassroots and what this trade show is all about. Uh, they have a scheduled lineup of classes that are coming up as well, which is killer. Uh, and these classes, as uh, Nick and I discuss, they do coincide during the times of the trade show, which is kind of a conflict for them and trying to figure out how on the side of things to really make this work, whether they want to start uh, the concept of doing a whole separate show that's just educational with classes and uh, panels of discussion, that kind of stuff. Um, or if they should just keep it the same with having classes during the trade show. There's just the different dynamics and go in there because we talked about the idea of leaving your booth to go take a class while you have like an assistant or one of your apprentices there helping sell your work. Um, and whether or not that's a positive thing or really if you should be there at your booth the entire time because you are the face of your glass and the relationships that you build with your customers is what's the most important. Um, and whether being in a class instead of selling your work, if that's going to maybe put a negative taste in the mouth of the shop owners because maybe they think you don't care about your work. Like there's all kind of weird dynamics that we talked about and you'll hear me talk about it again, but the word dynamic uh, for Nick and myself both was our word of the day. And because that word definitely comes in handy here because this industry and community is where we are now is there's lots of different dynamics that are going on uh, amongst us. Uh, but just to cover real quick, the classes that they are offering, uh, there are going to be uh, two-day classes, uh, Monday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday, August, October 9th, and then Tuesday, October 10th from 10 to 5 as well. Um, they have a private demo class uh, with Phil Siegel. It's $400 for the class. Uh, it's only limited to 12 people, uh, 12 students in the class. As uh, Phil is going to be focusing on character study, feature exploration into the art and craft of original character design, really helping you to find your voice in your work. Uh, there's going to be a private demo with Slinger. Uh, his class is called Back to the Future. Same price, 400 bucks uh, for the 12 limited seats. Uh, it's a two-day class, Legendary Marble Slinger. Learn old school techniques and styles with 20-year veteran pipe maker M. Slinger, a master of pattern techniques. He'll explain honeycombs, inside-out fuming tech disc flips, reticellos, bow ties, spirals, stuff and puffs, and some traditional shaping styles. Really awesome stuff. And then there's a general mission classes that they're offering. Uh, and this is 
what I was the most excited about. The other two classes with Slinger and Phil Siegel, don't get me wrong, these guys are both amazing artists. Um, and for four hundred dollars for the class, most of the classes I've taken were eight fifty to nine hundred dollar classes for two days to sit and watch an artist uh, explain things to you. So at four hundred bucks, it's a fucking steal. Um, but the general mission classes are pretty interesting. It's a hundred dollars for the seat uh, for two classes, and you're gonna get it getting talks and instructions with Mattiskuki, Calm, uh, Ben Belgrad, Johnny Rise, Alex Bicknair, and Juju talking about all things in glass from selling your work, branding your shit, doing marble techniques, glass techniques, all kind of amazing stuff. And for hundred dollars for a two day class is it's pretty awesome. And it's a general admission class, which means that this is open to the public as well. So if you're uh, not a vendor, if you're there just visiting uh, Madison for the trade show as an artist, uh, you can go there and sit in this class at the $100. Um, I think also the the private demo class is open to those that are, I think are going to the show. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but for more information, uh, you can contact uh, Nick or Ryan, whoever uh, will be talking to you at uh, glassrootsartshow.com. And I'll have those links and all the stuff in the show notes as well. So definitely want to share that with you. Uh, and then also, just to kind of touch base, don't forget too, uh, the Flow Magazine is offering a 10% discount for those that are new subscribers to their magazine. Just put in the code WISEGUY, W-Y-Z-G-U-Y, at checkout to get your 10% off their subscriptions to their publications, whether the digital or the paper versions of them. And uh, go check out Mountain Glass for all their sales going on right now. They have two Boro sales and one soft glass sale going on. Uh, mountainglass.com and uh, American Helix as well is on board still with us and then uh, our glassroots trade show so we got our four foundational sponsors still on uh something i wanted to share too just a one little thing and i'm going to be posting this today i am going to be offering uh you the artist or uh, if you're not a glass artist but you're in the industry and you have a product that you want to sell and market i'm going to be opening up 12 spots uh advertising spots on this podcast uh and just so you understand uh the, the why I'm doing this um, it's an, the average advertising well, I shouldn't say average but my advertising fees um, typically all my sponsors sign up for the entire year uh, but I do offer the minimum offering I do offer for sponsorships is a quarter and it's a quarter you pay up front for the whole thing uh, and it's over uh, it's around two thousand dollars for that three month spot now that being said what I'm offering to you is a hundred dollar advertising spot to come on one show and I will do a little voiceover read for your ad. And each episode here is averaging anywhere from eight to 10,000 downloads over about a four to five month period of time. So you have the chance to get your brand out there and exposed to an international community of over 65 countries and an audience that is continuing to grow. And I'm doing this because not only I feel like I wanna give back uh, because of where the show's at now, um, but I also want to just be able to offer a spot and a space for you to come on and promote yourself as a small business and a, and a glass artist too. Whether I mean, come on as a glass blower if you want to promote yourself, your company. If you have, if you're a tool maker, if you're a glass maker, whatever. Um, you know, I'm all about it and I want to help you out. And there's a link in the show notes for it um, for you to come on and hook that up. Um, you can also go to WiseGuyMediaAdvertising.com, I believe is the link, and I'll hook that up. Um, One second, dude. And, uh, but yeah, so I want to put that out there for you. And I'm just, again, I'm doing this just to, as an offering to help you out. So that being said, I'm going to bounce the hell out of here. Time to get this edited out and get it out today. So, uh, check it out and keep in touch. Any comments, questions, concerns, hit me up info or not info. That's the old one. It's uh, wiseguymedia at gmail.com. W Y Z G U I media at gmail.com. Send me questions, comments, concerns, and stay tuned to my Instagram live. I'll be posting now for the next month and a half uh, daily live videos in the studio as the Terminant of Fire is about to start, which I'm super pumped about, and I'll be getting into more discussion about that. So stay tuned to my Instagram at jmichaelglass, all one word, J-M-I-C-H-A-E-L glass. And until next time, we'll talk to you on the Wise Guy Radio Show. Enjoy this talk with Nick. We'll see you in Madison, Wisconsin. Love you.
Hey, what's up, Nick? Welcome back to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, man. Super pumped. So as we're getting now into, uh, I guess, midway through trade show season, per se, and uh, you guys got your trade show coming up here in October and the 9th and the 10th of uh, October, and it's the ninth year you guys are doing this up in Madison, Wisconsin at the Monona Plaza. Super pumped. You guys got a lot of awesome classes I want to cover and some fun stuff going on and lots of interesting dynamics going on in this culture and industry right now as this, as our pipe industry, in a sense, continues to grow. And I don't know if we're in the teenage phase yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, you know, definitely want to talk about all this stuff. But in the meantime, let's get into uh, what's come up here at Glass Roots. And you guys, uh, again, October uh, 9th and 10th coming up. And you got some pretty amazing classes. And uh, I don't know, man, I guess let's start there. Let's start with the classes and what's going on with the educational side of the show. We have uh, two different options. Um, and we, we changed it quite a bit from the layout. Well, we did completely change it from last year. Uh, received negative feedback from some of the people that were at the show about limiting the access to the public side of the show and having the classes be where the public side usually is. Um, so we've moved all of the classes upstairs to private rooms um, on a different floor. So the uh, downstairs is free and open to the public from, I think it's 11 a.m. until 10 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday and 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Wednesday, which is the way it used to be. So the classes that are taking place upstairs, there's three um, individual private classes. Uh, one of them is a slinger class, one of them is a kabuki class, and another is a Phil Siegel class. And then in the fourth room, which will be a larger room, is the general education classes. Those are 100 bucks a ticket. And at this point, we've got a Skooky teaching nuances of small vessels. Uh, ben Belgrid doing a, uh, he's going to talk about building a brand and giving back. And Johnny Rise uh, working the Boral Color Palette. He'll probably touch on all three different companies uh maybe like five of each color that's on monday wow. and then on tuesday uh calm kelvin mickle is teaching uh a three-hour class alex vicknair is going to do a class uh and juju is going to do a dot stack class um and that's all for 100 bucks so everything i just named you can and that goes from 10 a.m to 5 p.m on monday and tuesday man that's a hell of a deal <laughs> oh my god yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of damn knowledge you're getting passed over. I mean, yeah. Okay, continue. <laughs> well, it just it needs to happen. I mean, I know yeah. that there's Pilchuck in Salem, and there are uh, different conferences that take place. Um, but I would say none of it specifically focuses on the uh, ability for a broke pipe maker to be able to attend the classes. You know, yeah. um, I, I might be speaking out of line, but I'm assuming that Pilchuck and other places like that are going to be for um, either people with scholarships or money. Mm -hmm. you got to have money to do this. So the goal was to find teachers who would be willing to, and none of these people are donating their time. I'm definitely paying everybody something or giving them a booth or travel hotel. But to get that budget where the most we can make on this, we're selling 50 tickets at 100 bucks is $5,000. Well, you can't. I'm losing money. Yeah. That, I guess the point is, is losing money is, you know, um, the trade show makes a lot of money. So instead of doing contests like we did in the past where we give away $10,000, things like that, I'd rather give the money towards people who need it <laughs> and, and want to uh, um, learn. I guess off of it so it's sort of like putting on your own scholarship type of thing and I, I hope people take advantage of it this year you know the last yeah. two years they were not very well attended and I don't know if it's because I don't charge enough so people just don't find it desirable it's a weird thing when you put a lot of money on something people find it more desirable <laughs> yeah dude it's, I know it's weird isn't it it is the DFO's used to be like, you know, I don't know, what, 35 bucks a day or 50 bucks a day or something, and I've always been free and open to the public, and I, I, I don't have Buck and Banjo, but I've had an incredible amount of artists, and I mean, their turnout is 5,000 times the size of 
what we're able to pull every year. And my wife has always said it's because I don't charge anything. <laughs> Isn't that weird <laughs> to think about? <laughs> I know. It's so strange, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's just money dynamics. That, you know, there's a certain term, and I can't think of it right now, but it's like, you know, I could sell the best cup of coffee on earth and charge $5 for it, and you go to some place that's charging $16, and the coffee sucks, and people are going to buy the $16 cup of coffee because it's supposedly better because it's 16 fucking dollars. You know, it's just, yep. it's so weird. But yeah, I mean, I think what you're doing is good, though, and, um, you know, given given the artist not only a financially an affordable place to go and sell their work and promote themselves and market themselves and be in this really chill environment on a badass lake in this amazing community with these offerings to educate themselves even further. I mean, you're covering color work, you're covering marketing yourself and branding yourself, you're covering all these topics. My only question is, with the times that these classes are taken, is it going to allow the artist to be able to sell their glass at their booth and take the classes at the same time? Or are you trying to offer no, this? No. Nope. So yeah. So how no, does this, how does that work? They, well, that's that's the big issue. So next year, I was going to, and I, I just don't have the balls to do it. Split the show <laughs> into two and make it a, a five or six day thing, and and I just don't have the energy. Well, dude, to it'd be an ex- make sure that you shouldn't though. That'd be the, the expense for the artist alone. They couldn't afford to do it. But that is the only way my artists that are production workers or um, your bread and butter folks, mm-hmm. these classes completely overlap the trade show. Right, right. So in order for these guys to be able to come out and do both, I would have to extend it a yeah. couple of days. Yeah, so yeah. What, what I've been considering is just pairing it up with uh, a different event. And I've got a couple things in mind, but completely taking the education aspect away from grassroots keeping Glassroots a trade show because that's what it's always been and mm-hmm. I mean, that's where all the money generated to pay for all these things comes from um, and then you know doing an education thing uh, not over the same dates in the future I think would make the most sense because I, I believe I could get this kind of lineup um, anytime you know some of these teachers come because it is during Glassroots but some of them are coming just simply because the pay is good or me and the person have a good relationship or they just believe that this type of education needs to take place yeah you know yeah so i'm, I'm not going to say the ideas i have of where i would like to team up but um you know I, I can see the education thing leaving madison next year and just focusing on demos and a trade show you know for 2018 yeah yeah but well, yeah you you can't yeah. unless if you have someone work in your booth Right, you, exactly. You can't do both. And which that's what is I was going to really say. Really big bummer for a lot of people. Well, you know, though, at the same time, I I think the dynamic of that, I think the dynamic is going to be my word of the day. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, I think it, right now, in the terms of the the way that I'm finding the artists I've interviewed on the show and just people I know in general, those that are able to go do a trade show, even if you know, as long as it's not to say like their first trade show per se to learn this process or affordability wise. But a lot of artists have an assistant going with them, or they have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or wife or whatever going with them to assist them. And I think that this is this kind of concept is going to allow the artist to teach their assistant how to sell their work, how to promote their work. How let what, me let me touch on that though, real yeah, quick. Yeah, that yeah. was one of the things that you wanted to speak on. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I thought, you know, I didn't know where we would talk about it, but advice for artists on how to approach a trade show. Yep. Nobody can sell your work better than you right almost if you're just that terrible at it and there are some artists that just have bad you know uh vocabulary writing whatever it is you know um introvert they don't want to do it but for the most part if you're going to succeed at any of these trade shows now the shops almost if you have a name and then that's where you're talking about having assistance mm-hmm. or you, you know girl like uh, Calm's going to teach a class, and uh, he's he's going to bring somebody out with him to sell his work, and it's because his work sells itself. Right, exactly, and that's okay. that's kind of where I was going with it. Exactly, that that exact thing, right? Well, there. but that's that's fifteen percent of my trade show population. Right, exactly. You know, the other eighty-five percent, those proto dudes that are there. I mean, and that is the heartbeat of the industry. Mm-hmm. Still, that is where all of these shops, except for like maybe thirty of them, you know, make their money to be able to buy nicer high-end pieces. It all comes from Proto, and a lot of these guys, when they step away from their booth, or if they have someone run their booth, or if they team up with somebody to run their booth, they fail. <laughs> hmm. Like 
every single time, every time. I can pretty much walk around my show floor now on setup day and just walk up to people and tell them, you know, if you do this, if you don't do this, if you guys are seriously going to put three different people's work in this 10 by 10 uh, and have it laid out like this, you, you guys are all going to fucking, you know, be angry at me. Mm-hmm. Essentially, <laughs> it's where it comes down to very yeah. rarely do do vendors accept responsibility um, of their own, you know, when, when something doesn't go right. And I think it makes it even worse when they see success around them, but they're not having it. And then when you start to frown and get down on yourself, uh, no one wants to approach you then, you know? Yeah, Nobody exactly. wants to walk up to you. You're, you're like a fucking magnet of like detraction you know yep. you are you are repulsing people away instead of attracting people which happens pretty quick when you have a bad day or you know you, you fight with your girlfriend in the elevator or you drop a piece to start the show or whatever it is you know if you don't shake it and get the smile back on your face uh, it's it's a rough show mm. yeah it makes total sense yeah and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you know and that being said so i guess let me back up because my brain's going to 10 different ways right now. So then that being said, you recommend that the artists that are selling their work there just sell their shit. Cause I know a lot of people in the past when like last year, for instance, I had last minute, my mom pulled on some shit on me and I couldn't make the show. And I had a couple artists reach out to me like, Hey, we'll sell your shit for you. And I, and I was, I didn't do it. Cause I, what you're saying is I didn't want to take my stuff and take space from them necessarily or clutter their tabletop you know or whatever well, there's all different situations i mean there's distributors who are set up to sell other people's stuff but i'm talking about your uh you know i'm going to keep going back to the, the bread and butter of the industry mm-hmm. and i have a lot of that at my show and a lot of them i've seen split away from doing doubles with people and they now have their own booths and i say it to them you know i know that you might not be able to afford to do your own booth but if you did pay the extra you would probably quadruple your sales think about it like this if a buyer comes in to your booth and he's looking at one of the artists work but not the other you immediately have that weird energy from the other artist whose work isn't being looked at so unless if you work really well together and that other artist is able to like just basically dip out of the booth and let that guy have you get what i'm saying yep absolutely it's a it's a really tough fucking dynamic for that other shop owner to put in a three or four thousand dollar order if he's really digging this person's work with this other guy two inches behind him because a 10 by 10 is you're there on top of each other whether you do a you where you can walk in or there's a table straight across in the front yeah so a lot of these buyers just walk right by they like one thing they don't like the other you know i mean mm-hmm. it's you you never see professional companies teaming up with other companies to sell their wares Right. Yeah, exactly. You always have your own standalone booth. Right. That's what I've been, but you know, I I don't, I just discourage it. I don't keep it from happening. You can put four fucking people in your booth if you want to. I don't (laughs) set the the parameters on it. I just tell you that you're probably going to be unhappy at the end of it. Well, I I know myself personally that some of the shows I've done locally in town, um, like over here at Zen Glass, they'll have like their Pendant Palooza. And uh, my brother and I usually share a space there, and him and I are, do do pretty good. We sell a lot of our pendants and you know whatever other things we have there. And for me, walking you know walking around and talking to other artists, and nobody's selling shit, and you can really, like you're saying, you can feel the vibe. Like they're hot and sweaty, they're frustrated, they're not selling anything. They've got like three of their friends hanging out with them, trying to sell their glass, and they're just sitting back there, just kind of like not pouting, but kind of sorta, you know. And you can really tell oh, man. how frustrated they are. <laughs> <laughs> on the last day of the show, I would never do it, but if if I could just have my videographer go around and like just take pictures of the sad faces <laughs> right. uh, that that are uh, I mean, and the last day of the show is when you're fucking like your your sharks come out. Yep. People that haven't made purchases the whole show, and they're liable to walk up and buy your whole booth. Yeah, exactly. So I have a number of those yeah. people who walk the trade show floor on the last day, and that's that's what they're there for. Yeah. And man, yeah, I can I can picture a few people last year. I mean, you spent all this money to get here and to do the whole deal. I mean, and how many buyers do you need? You know, I mean, you only need what ten good, fifteen good sales if they're the right kind of sales yep. to make the whole thing worthwhile. You know, multi thousand dollar sales yeah. would be pretty phenomenal for most people. Well, there's always at least two hundred shops walking the trade show floor. 
you, how I look at it is if you can't get 10 or 15 of them to engage with you and purchase from you, then you're just doing it wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Or your stuff is not priced point, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, proper or your booth setup is not attractive. And it's definitely a clear divide. I mean, you can walk through the show now and there's a lot of really, really great looking booths. And a lot of those people that are in those booths are very successful in their good looking booths. Yeah. And that's huge, man. Take that proto, put it up on a pedestal. (laughs) If it's a fucking $2 bet, if that's what you make, put it on the pedestal. (laughs) Yep, Literally, bro. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. A nice shining glass fucking spinning thing with a light on it. Big fucking spotlight. Here's my two dollar back, bitch. <laughs> and then they buy a thousand of them. You know, it's like, but like you know, like um, I bring I brought Chris Piazza on this year, and last year when I first brought him on, uh, he Mr. Extra Crispy, um, or not Extra Crispy, it's Crispy Glass. There's two different Crispies in our industry. He's the other one, and uh, but I first brought him on right before he did Glass Roots last year, and then I brought him on this back in February as a follow up, and dude, he fucking killed it. And it was it wasn't a surprise for him. He knew going in what he was up to. It was his second time, I think, second or third time doing that trade show with you guys. And he's at a point now. I mean, he's 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 the kind of artist who started off on his own, got in some weird space in his life, figured his shit out, got successful, was able to buy his own house, bought his own car, has a studio in his garage, has now three employees working for him. And he's able to keep up with these orders, but he's having to learn as he goes. But he's learning because he's got guys like you in a trade show who's giving them an environment to go learn how to do this shit. And now that he's learned how to do it, he's getting these huge orders. But he's also now got to figure out how to make the orders and how to fulfill the orders and stuff. And we talked a lot about that, that process of, okay, now now what do you do? Now you got your orders. Now what do you do? And it was a cool conversation because, you know. I, I listened to it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's it is. I love it because like there's so many artists out there that are like, oh, I need to get a hundred different orders. I'm like, bro, you need like ten. You don't want a yeah. hundred orders. I mean, that'd be nice, but you don't want a hundred orders. I promise you. Because like they're well, years. It doesn't ago. matter if it's one or a hundred. It's how you're treating the orders and how you're treating it as a business. Right. And exactly. The, the folks who figured it out and do the follow up. Yep. You know, when they see the package was delivered, they do a courtesy call three days later, assuming they've opened the box to make sure that everything was to the standards. I mean, yeah. that if you have that kind of fucking business practice, you will get returned repeat, you know, uh, orders, yeah. customers. Yep, that's, exactly. That's, then you don't need to do a trade show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I completely agree. sit on the computer and take your shit. And, and yeah. I've, I've got lots of vendors who no longer have a use or they only do one show you know whether it's mine or Vegas because they just need to get out and like Jay from Evil Empire he doesn't fucking need to do a, a trade show you know he does it because I think he enjoys it it's a great way to show off his stuff and give everybody a fair shot mm-hmm. at getting a couple pieces yeah exactly well like I just, just interviewed Scott with uh, Cherry Glass and you know he was saying like him and his family because they're a family company and they were dated 10 trade shows one year I'm like dude that's fucking not only the expense well, but the amount I think of time he found out, though you know he i don't think i think his sales you know went across the board yeah he then, was losing money know, when you exactly yeah. you know i i don't even need to he- hear it from him to know that he's losing money yeah but absolutely I just know the industry and there's like fucking deborah from jellyfish and i don't even think she does all those trades does anymore but there's very few people who even dabble in yeah. all of the shows because you're seeing the same buyers at you know, twenty five percent overlap at every show. So overall, what are you really seeing for new buyers? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yep, absolutely. You know, and, the, and it's a huge difference because it's what's interesting as like as an artist and knowing and and growing up in the art field just in general with my dad being a musician and an artist and traveling and doing tours, and then getting into the Renaissance Festival when I started doing my glass and the Renaissance Festival that whole situation is totally different from any trade show because you're going from city to city to city. You don't have wholesalers that you're going to see every year. You have towns with their people coming in to buy from you. So it's like it's, it's a whole different ball of wax, I guess, in a sense, in terms of selling your work. But it's still a, it's still a, a sales technique. It's still how do you market yourself? How do you sell yourself? Should you be like the guy in freaking you know mid, the Middle East? And you got Akbar at his trade, you know his, his booth trying to sell you some fucking fish and fresh beads and stuff. You know whatever, you know yeah they're yelling and stuff or 
are you sitting back chilling? And I think that's what's fun with your show is it's, again, it's an affordable way for artists to come in and learn how to do a trade show and find out that they don't need to go do 10 fucking trade shows. It's just, you know, which I want to get into here in a little bit later on in the talk of, you know, just how many, <laughs> how many trade shows there are. I mean, you can fill up your goddamn calendar now with all these trade shows. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But, uh, yeah, man. So, I guess when with with the selling the work at the trade shows, are, you know, you're talking about the guys that come in just for the fun of it, more or less nowadays, because they don't need to go to a trade show. Um, and then well, the guys, no, I that, mean, they 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 do make money. I mean, it's it's not that they don't. Some people have just honed in their business to where they can gather a body of work long enough, you know, and not and not get paid or sell a few pieces, and then be able to go have it's it's like opening up a pop up shop. Right, you know, right, boom! Yeah. Here I am, cash and carry, uh, which is sweet. You know, shipped to just about anybody. You know, it's just seriously fucking sell the pieces off the table, put cash. I mean, that's if I could do that as an artist, that's the way I would do it. Yeah. You know, Devin and Paul. There's there's a number of people at at the show now that have uh, figured out um, a way to make that work. Size low, mm -hmm. uh, and it's neat to watch. You know, the just the varying degrees of. Um, business levels that that are at the show and yeah. every year i feel like the people um that saw it the year before that were new to it really do pay attention and come back with a better looking booth or um maybe a, a clean t-shirt on this year or they remember <laughs> to, you know i mean dude hygiene <laughs> and I, I, it's, it's huge. funny but it's not like, no that's what i'm it laughing it really is because a lot of these shop owners are um not necessarily into uh, a lot of what's in our industry. Yeah, they're not into the culture. Strictly a business. Yeah, exactly. yeah I mean, and even if they are a little bit, part of the culture for them isn't um, just the raw right. fucking, you know, hippie side or wook side or whatever it is we want to call. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I had I had a stint in my life, everybody probably does, where they grow up and, you know, go through changes. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's to each their own personal choice. But I do know that hygiene plays uh, a huge role um, in interaction with uh, shop owners when yeah. they approach you coming into the booth. Well, I think that goes along with, like I was saying earlier, with the maturation of our industry and going from, we might be in the teenage phase right now, you know, where we're, I think we were, they were kind of getting there. Maybe we're about 13, 14, you know, maturity wise. And, you know, I know at that age of my life, I, I, I didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do, but I was running around barefoot and not giving a shit, not cleaning my fingernails or nothing, you know, up until I was probably in my early 20s. I didn't wear shoes for like three years, you know, <laughs> but I knew where it was getting me, which was really nowhere unless I wanted to continue living that way. And I didn't, obviously. So now I have a nice shoe collection, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing you bring up because I think a lot of people are on the, the fence about that where they saw a way to make some money and not have to pay taxes and keep cash in their pocket and live in a counterculture. And then they got a little taste of success and now you have to figure out, I mean, you, you know, and I'm not just talking about the high end people. I'm talking about people who start cashing checks from business, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then they're put in that position of, do you fucking make the step towards transitioning into what is called a businessman? And that yeah. doesn't mean you have to wear nice clothes. You just have to know your shit yep, and exactly. be an entrepreneur, you yep. know? I mean, and you can be an entrepreneur and live in your fucking underwear yeah. if you want to. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. I know I do. <laughs> There's been many nights in my studio in my underwear because it's too fucking hot. <laughs> but yeah, but then again, bro, that's what I think of what I love about what you guys do. I mean, you're really all about promoting and helping the artists come in and really find their voice, find out who they are, how, you know, and if they don't have certain skill sets, again, you're offering these classes. That's going to, in a sense, give, it's, it's, it's not that you're teaching them, but you are giving them advice and information that they can do with what they want to do with. And if they're smart, they're going to take it to heart and really pay attention to it, you know, because it's, it's, it's just, there's the way this industry is growing right now and the way the laws are changing, you have to kind of catch up to what's going on out there in this world to, really still be irrelevant in 10 years from now or you're going to be left behind in the dust maybe or you could still just keep making rapping rakes yeah. <laughs> I mean fuck man they're 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 going to be around another you know they'll always be around I mean people people with good business sense that haven't changed their business model too much and they're just riding through all the different waves mm -hmm. uh, and sticking with what they do 
uh, those are the people um, that I see still being around. You know, the independent artist is going to have recessions to deal with, mm-hmm. you know, or maybe they have to go back and I'm talking five years, 10 years, 20 years. I mean, a lot of these people we're talking about are in their 20s, early 30s. Right, know? exactly. So, yeah. You know, better be either fucking investing into fiat or Bitcoin or something or <laughs> precious metals or uh, you better, you know, be ready to work, right? Yep. I mean, that's, that's what you have to do. You know, there is no retirement in this country anymore unless if you're blessed with a, what do they call it, a, um, where the parents, what what is it? Oh, it's like a trust fund? <laughs> yeah, the, all of that type of thing, and I yeah. don't know that that's really a blessing, you know? No, I don't uh, think it is at all. Otherwise, <laughs> Even most of the kids I know that had something like that or inherited a bunch of money really were all on fucking hard drugs. <laughs> yeah, totally, dude. And another fucking broke. You know? <laughs> yeah, a few of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You know, and and I'm glad you brought up the rap and rake stuff because part of part of my concern and the frustration that I have dealt with personally, and I know a lot of artists, especially in Florida, and I don't know if Florida's got such a weird, it's it's such a weird community here. Just because well, it sticks out like a red thumb in the country for a lot of things. A yeah, lot of the yeah. Time when it comes to laws and you know rules. Yep. Yeah, and this ever growing. I mean, this community is like over the last five years is huge. How many how many glass blowers alone are in Florida? Much less now the collectors and the shops and you know everybody's well, now look at the shops though. I mean, you no, have Daniel who you know uh, who is um, <clears throat> uh, what the hell? Um, you got Grateful Jays and you got Marleys, but then um, what is uh, Hyman? who was doing mm-hmm. huge things, you know, a few years ago. And when you had that explosion of shops, I mean, that just must uh, create a whole bunch of glass blowers, right? Yeah. Essentially. Isn't that what happened? Yeah, somewhat. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't. Wonderland. Honest, yeah, Wonderland. Yeah, Wonderland. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know, I honestly don't, don't really know. I don't know if it was, well, I do know in this area with Zen Glass, there was a, a they, they were, um, Dave Walker, Dave and Josh are the two guys that own Zen. And for a while, Dave was, um, and he may be still doing it, but uh, we have Eckerd College here. And he was uh, teaching their, their, Eckerd College is like a make your own school kind of program, kind of kind of college. And part of the offerings is that they could take a glass blowing class or a semester at Zen or two semesters. And a lot of the kids that went there and did, and did glass blowing classes, they weren't learning the pipes right away, but when they were done with school, they came back and learned how to make pipes. And there's a whole generation of Zen glass pipe makers in this state right now and throughout the country that have moved around or whatever. And uh, I don't know if that was part of it. I'm not saying that they saturated Florida, but the I don't, I, I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. I'm, it's sounds, kind of, it's confusing. Sounds like what uh, Jeff Baker did down in Austin, Texas. He just pumped out a tremendous amount of uneducated lamp workers right. <laughs> that knew how to make a little bit of this and that but you know uh yeah it there it all comes from somewhere right pockets yeah. of people willing to bring in large groups of people put them on a torch for the first time and usually it has to do with i hate to say it like this but sweatshop minded ideas mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you need this thing done and this is what you're going to learn how to do and that's their experience with getting on a torch is pulling those five colors and flaring out these two sizes and pretty much doing that over and over again yeah exactly yeah yeah but you know i've i've the first i guess the where i was going with it was the frustration i've had to deal with is because there are so many trade shows nowadays is a lot of these shops nowadays don't want to buy anything from the local artists they just go strictly to the trade shows and it's hard to establish relationships like there's specific shops that i go to and sell to that still do the trade shows and still buy my work so it's whatever but there's a lot of shows that are like small mom and pops that are like, yeah, we're not buying right now because we're saving up to go to blah, you know, whatever trade show they're heading towards, or they just got back from this trade show. Or yeah, they... but remember, a lot of those places, if they're going to uh, a Champs or a big, I'll bet the budget they're talking about is vaporizers, grinders, rolling papers. I mean, seriously, you know? Yeah, uh, I, I agree I would, on that end. Absolutely. It's it's the truth. You know, I would say one out of 10 is truly glass eccentric um, mm-hmm. in shops. And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm, I'm just saying that yeah, yeah. the budget that most of these people are talking about, uh, and they get terms with a lot of those companies, you know? So if they go and put 25% down and get the show deal, then they don't have to pay the rest for 30 days. And a lot of glass blowers come in and they're not leaving without getting paid yeah. that day. Right, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's yeah. tough for a lot of people that are doing small business um, scale shit. You know, there's a lot of things that, and you got to remember locally, 
a lot of shops get put in the position where if that glass blower goes and sells with three other people in the area, what the fuck is the point? Mm-hmm. You're better off going and finding that thing that is made somewhere else that none of your other competitors are carrying. Yeah, man, you and know? that so yeah, there's always absolutely. two sides to it. Yeah, and that's and I did a whole show on the on selling to a distributor because that's that was part of an issue I ran into was like I one of my distributors they did a national you know tour in a sense selling all their shit and one little community up in North Florida in Jacksonville. That whole area became saturated with my work, and there were two specific shops that were far enough from each other where I just sold to those two shops, and they stopped buying my work because everybody in the fucking town now has my stuff there. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, fuck. Now I'm I'm losing money because my distributor I used to have sold all my shit. You know, it's just it's Put like it this do I, way, any yeah. good business relationship that I've ever had with a shop. I'm not saying back in the day that I didn't sell to two different places in the same town, but when when I when I did the gun case thing and drove around in selling in Minnesota, Iowa, not necessarily in Colorado, but definitely the whole Texas area um, between Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, Austin, I really did just pick a store. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Houston, I sold to the BC. And when I went to Austin, it was the gas pipe until the new BC opened up. Um, And those, you're you're far more likely to get a huge reorder and to do better business when they know that you're leaving their town after uh, you sell to that one person. So it was always Steve at Secrets in Chicago and Kelly at The Connection in Iowa. Um, It's the truth, you know? And I know that that's tough for an artist um, to, to deal with like that. And a lot of them can't get around on a national scale. But, um, I mean, just from my perspective, you know, it, it would have been really difficult to go into three different competing stores in Austin or Houston and expect to have anywhere near the size sale I had from the one store. You yeah. Yep. What I'm saying? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I completely under, agree. And, and a lot of times I've had conversations with shop owners who were like, Hey, can we make you exclusive for our area? I'm like, yeah, that's fine, but you got to spend this amount of See, money. You know that I've never done. That that was never the deal. It was just if I come to your shop and you spend enough, I'm going to shake your hand and say I'm going to the next town. But that's when things get all fucked up. Right. If you enter into those agreements. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, they're never going to spend the five grand a month that you're going to ask No, for hell no. And that's why I've never done it. So. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, that's why I told them, like, if you all spend five grand a month, I'll do it. And But it never happens, so I don't do it. But, I, but I, ethically wise, I, I know just doing this long enough and understanding business that like you're saying I'm not going to do that but then you go to guys like say Dale Chihuly for instance who I've heard stories with him where he's gone when he first started selling his glass he didn't sell his first major piece of art for like 13 years in his career and then he put his glass in this museum or gallery space whatever it was for one of his first shows and he didn't sell shit for like the first two weeks and he went back in this this gallery and added zeros to all the price tags and then sold everything that month and then he would go across the street to the place that was like the other, say the gallery across the street from them, and they would be like, "Hey, we see you're selling across the street." And he's like, "Well, either you want my shit or you don't." They just sold everything. I'm gonna sell to them too. You can have my stuff if you want it. And they're wanting like no compete contracts. And he's like, "Fuck you! I'm gonna sell to you and you and you and you guys will all buy my shit and hopefully you guys will all sell my stuff." And really, that doesn't ever happen. Like, I don't know any artists that can go to four different galleries that are on the same block and sell all your shit to them and. They're all going to be happy and want to sell your work, you know. Oh, well, they might not be happy, but there's definitely there. It's happening. Yeah, it totally. <laughs> can, is. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do the name drop, but goddamn, there's five of them. You know that, and all of that is going to come back. Yeah, I completely uh, in, agree. In a very negative manner. Yeah. Um, like I said, a lot of these folks that we're talking about are late twenties, early thirties. Yeah. So, where is it at when you're forty, or when you're forty-five, or you know, fifty? Yeah. Yeah, man, and like we were saying, you know, it's it's the the entitlement kind of concept that a lot of the young generation has. And I'm not discriminating or saying anything about anybody in a culture wise or a whole group of people, but there are a vast group of people in our industry that have ego and have this whole mentality that I deserve to have this. Why don't I have this? You know, you have this, I should have this too. And the entitlement thing is what I think is really gonna knock a lot of people out of the industry potentially yeah i mean dude you're making you're making things with your own hands and getting recognition on a grand scale it's got to be a tremendously great feeling you know mm-hmm. very much like what athletics is except on your own terms and you get to fucking do what you want yeah. with no coach telling you anything you yeah. know so i mean it's it's got to be an incredible feeling yeah 
to to be able to travel anywhere you want to go and work with who anybody you know whoever you want to work with and put whatever price you want on your pieces i mean it's it's pretty fucking nuts yeah it's it's interesting i don't know if uh you know um if it is even ego as much as it is just it must be crazy for a lot of these people that uh five years ago didn't know that it was even going to happen to them or mm-hmm. maybe they had hoped or you know what i'm saying yeah it, yeah it, we all we all think we know how would we would behave or want to react or you know put off i guess in those situations but when you start going to shows and leaving with a hundred grand in your pocket that's yours free and clear <laughs> you know who knows how you're gonna fucking behave or react after you know yeah doing that for a couple of years you know i'm just i guess playing the, the devil's advocate yeah no what well, i completely understand what you're saying though for sure yeah so i guess but yes yeah yeah so do you think the thing is um a, a fucking crazy thing to deal with right now in this industry. Yeah, and you don't you don't really think then that in a sense that the the trade show circuits per se are, are hurting the local local artists for the smoke shops. Um, I mean, look at where the trade shows are. You know, everybody said Madison's trade show was going to really hurt the local shops because the collectors and the public. I mean, dude, I did the public open open and free to the public uh, in 2011 and 12 on the last day mm-hmm. and. Across the board, vendors said they didn't sell a fucking thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, on that end of things, no. Um, and every economy is different. Are you in a college town? Are you in a summer tourist town? Are you in a town with 500 other lamp workers like Austin, Texas or Portland, Oregon? Or are you in Las Vegas where there's multiple trade shows, uh, but... You know, and now I guess there is quite a glass blowing scene there. You mm-hmm. know, I, I'm going to bet there probably wasn't 10 years ago, but it's just what are the laws? You know, where are you in terms of demographic is really what it comes down to. But no, I don't think that the trade shows overall um, have have a negative impact. I think it depends on how you behave as a shop owner towards lamp workers too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's yep. a lot of shops who are uh, known to just be not great to deal with in terms of individuals going in you know they're more set up to deal with companies to put their orders in through yeah it's true i I have a lot of shops i've gone through over the years that are like yeah we just go through catalogs we just buy from catalogs and i'm like well then you don't really know what you're getting and you don't know where it's made why don't you buy it for me instead you know i made it (laughs) and they're like well you just if you go to a if you go to like what cornerstone's catalog used to be or um you know a jellyfish or a chameleon catalog or Mm -hmm. dynamite look at it it's fucking incredible yeah you know so if you price point wise can't even move a hundred dollar spoon why would you 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 get what i'm saying it it really goes back to the ease in your time and you know are you training employees to do your ordering for you or are you actually taking the time to go to shows and shake people's hands and you know make relationships with people yeah i guess it's with shop owners wise it's that difference between the shop owner who's going to prefer just to buy china shit because they can make a bigger profit on it compared to buying from the local artist who's making the china killers and they can make the same profit on the local artist but they just refuse to see that they don't see that perspective they just see the the dollar signs coming out you know coming in in a sense because fuck i go to every it's still we've passed ordinances in this county that i live in years and years ago and every gas station on the goddamn corner now still selling pipes <laughs> you know <laughs> and the most of it are all india china craft there are some local gas stations that do buy from local glass blowers which i think is killer i mean you can walk in there and tell that's not something from china you know it's it's, it's kind of interesting that's a that's a new one yeah that is that's <laughs> yeah that's great yeah, I actually had a, a gas station, a Chevron here years ago, my old distributor sold to, and this guy refused to buy import glass. He was all about wanting to be the one gas station in the area that sold local American glass, which was awesome. And people went there and bought his stuff because of it. You know, it's, it's a whole different whole different concept. And I guess that's what it is. It's all about the, the mentality and the mindset of the, the shop owner, the glass artist. There's so many weird dynamics that are all involved in this whole thing. You know, there's something for everybody, I guess, when it comes down to it. It's just where do we want to go with our glass? I don't get it sometimes, and sometimes I do. Oh, you still there, dude? Did I lose you? Oh, yeah. Yep. No, okay. I'm here. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah, so that being said, talking about this crazy saturation of trade shows. So I was going through the calendar earlier this morning. And it seems like every 
two to three months, there's at least two trade shows going on starting in January. And like, you know, we said kind of pre pre recording here that the, the winter shows, you know, the age and champs winter shows always seem to be like the big highlight of the year. That's like the show everybody's talking up after Christmas, all that kind of shit. But then once you get into the, the spring and summer and fall, it just seems like the, the door is wide open and you got 25,000 fucking trade shows going on. <laughs> yeah, you, you have a lot and they are definitely increasing in number. Uh, you have the Florida show with champs. I mean, what you have is uh, cutthroat competition um, completely surrounding grassroots trade show dates yeah. continuously. Yeah. It's, there's no other way to that. I've had all, all trade shows take a shot at the date. <laughs> Every one of them, Champs has taken two shots this year. Uh, H has definitely taken shots pre-date two times uh, in, in October. You had the Jason Harris trade show that went, ended like two days before my show did back in 2011, that Atlantic City show we did. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, you know, you, you'd like to think it's not intentional, but I mean, they're like, every one of these shows have definitely stepped within like 48 to 72 hours of our posted dates that are always a year out, you know, you know, I'm booked through 2020. Anybody could call and ask what the, what the dates are. Yeah. I, I mean, I literally spent like 40 minutes going through everybody's calendars and all these trade shows and you're, you are, you're sandwiched in between two of the bigger names in the trade shows and they both have like two trade shows outside of, you know, it's like you're like a fucking double cheeseburger. And you're and you're just like the cheese in the middle of it all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, but you but you guys are you know you, you guys are still maintaining and growing and understanding who you are and you're keeping your philosophy. You're not trying to just expand out and just be. We're just a trade show. We're you know it's. I don't know. I, I just don't no know. going going away from the Austin awesome show was a smart move even though it was a great place to do it and working with Craig and the armadillo was awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, Going back to one trade show just made life so much easier and it made more sense for the, you know, economy as a whole, even though now HE has a show in Dallas and we're still continuously asked all the time to put the show back on in Austin. Uh, Madison's, enough for me <laughs> dude i could only imagine i can't even imagine doing one trade show much less four <laughs> you know well, there a lot of these shows are just sloppy thrown together fucking no thought or love put into it repeat the cycle you know yeah that's, that's what i want to talk about know, like do you really think like the, the fact that these guys these companies have these major trade shows i mean how much effort can you really put into four fucking trade shows uh just the the basic to make sure the booster there the pipe and drape and your buyer clientele, which I give them credit, the buyers show up, you know, still, yeah. I think, I mean, maybe not as much in the summer shows, but, um, that, that winter show that we were talking about, it's not the spring show anymore. Spring is now spring mm-hmm. and there's, you know, there's just a lot of shows. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Cause I don't, hey, Las Vegas, uh, that, that, that was spawned as a, uh, I mean, it, you know, <laughs> directly to, um, compete with ag mm-hmm. that's 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 what it is you know i'm not going to beat around the bush yeah that's and i think why it, that show exists yeah absolutely yeah and then when i first saw that come out i was i was kind of drawn back by it and then when you and i talked last time you know about that coming in and i didn't even know it was ex- it existed until you brought it up and then all of a sudden it was kind of like and i talked to box fan about it too and it was like the response that the artist had for that show at first was kind of apprehensive but once the artist got into that show the response i heard is fantastic Especially compared to how the the fiasco at Age last year all went down, and then you have this you know night and day version of of what it should be like you like, Glass Vegas is like the the West Coast version of Glass Roots in a sense. It is, but it's definitely Vegas. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're in a casino, uh, but they did a really. I, I didn't get to go. I had fucking whacked my head uh, a couple of weeks or a month before. I was experiencing some serious vertigo Jesus, so I, I was not actually there uh but yeah i mean everything i heard the feedback that the ladies received um after the show was done um, was positive across the board all the people that uh i um know that were there you know wisconsin people and uh yeah ryan was there my employee i mean it was it was all good it was set up to succeed i mean mm-hmm. it's what 
everybody had asked me to do back in 2011 and 12 was put glass roots in Vegas and I would just laugh. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what is the point of all of it then if I move this thing to Vegas? That's why I did what I did mm -hmm. was so people didn't have to go to Las Vegas, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but these ladies live in Vegas and they have, uh, well, Leanne has uh, multiple decades of trade show experience and she's tied in. So, I mean, this is her hometown, and they hit the ground running. Um, I, I did go out there, helped her with just the basics, and it's not even help. Um, at first, I think we both thought there might be a, a way for me to work with them, uh, but I, 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 in the end, decided to keep my identity separate so their identity was their own. You understand? So yeah, it yeah. wasn't this glassroots tied-in thing, even though a lot of people know that, you know, I gave a lot of referrals and did my best to get you know vendors and buyers alike to go to the thing uh, they did all of the legwork on social media and pictures you know i mean they they are going to all the events they're sponsoring the right things um, they're immediately becoming you know a part of the inner workings of the positive side of the community mm -hmm. and i see them i see them being around for years to come because they run their business very professional you know, they have an office, IT team. I mean, there is well to do when it comes to trade show management as you can get. So, you know, I see I see nothing but success in their future. And the hotel they did it at, yes, we did choose to go across the street from Champs, and I probably pushed for that. Uh, and I think it was scary <laughs> for them in the beginning, but it worked because buyers that showed up the night before for Champs went to this buyer preview and their their room was filled that's awesome filled i mean i'm pretty sure a lot of people did really fucking good at that show yeah the people i've talked to that did it they they had a successful time I mean, they didn't walk away millionaires <laughs> but they they got huge exposure and got a shit ton of orders out of it and not to mention well, it was, was just no, fun it, yeah i know it was fun they had live music they did giveaways they did uh like a best glass competition type of thing. Yep. They had demos and they're in the casino, right? So I, I had stayed at this place and it's a newly renovated, like $80 million makeover. Uh, fucking awesome sports room casino, you know, like really, really nice. And the rooms are like 40 bucks. There's no um, union fee to get in the back door at this place. They got the fees all waived. So, I mean, it was really affordable for an artist to go do this show. Yeah, that's really what it sounded affordable. like. Yeah. Do you, so do yep. you, do you think like as as the as you guys continue to grow and I don't mean grow in terms of expanding but just grow as in terms of annually continuing doing this and fine tuning your shows. Yeah. And then with the Las Vegas, it seems like you guys are setting this whole this standard of what this community needs in terms of a trade show and do you find like the other trade shows are kind of like trying to follow your lead? to entice the blowers to be like, hey, we're like a glass roots trade show too, even though we're this big corporation, blah, blah, blah. Like, do you, do you feel that kind of, that weird um, relationship? I don't think are... AG is doing anything or the big is doing anything to follow my lead. I think they're definitely both off in their own direction and Champs is so big. Uh, I think when it comes to how artists are treated and the cheap artist booth idea or I think they came up with the Zen, I mean, yeah, I've definitely been... Um, directly uh, mimicked or copied, but I, I think it's just natural in the trade show progression mm -hmm. to see what other people are doing and if it works. Um, I, I, nothing I've done is original, you know. Yeah, in exactly. Terms of like putting a, uh, it, it might be it might be unique that I have a trade show and lamp working happening side by side with a fucking DJ playing, but like in terms of the general idea of things being sold and things happening overlapping with each other. Um, nothing's original in this world anymore for the yeah. most part. <laughs> yeah, ain't that the damn truth? Uh, I, I'm, I'm dancing around your question because, I mean, it's, you know, in some ways, it's not necessarily the show being bit as much as just the fucking very drastic date choices that these companies choose to lay over my show. And mm -hmm. so that tells me that if you can't do it the right way, do it the wrong way, yeah. I guess. And the artists see it. You know, I'll get text messages and emails from people saying, well, now I'm not going to do 
any of their shows. It's not working for them. You know, you're not going to, I've heard that, and Jeff has said this, that he was going to do a Chicago show hmm. from Champs. You know, I've, I mean, just keep in mind, I've, I've dealt directly with all of these people at one point in time, and Jeff in particular, trying to more or less team up. Las Vegas would have never happened if Jeff would have just accepted Glassroots for what it was. I would have uh, joined Champs. But the terms were ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I could only so imagine. Now, now, now you get what you get. Now you have fucking Las Vegas yeah. <laughs> across the street. you know. And I did my best to try and get him and her to see eye, eye to eye and... Um, I don't know that that'll ever uh, happen either. You know, it would be great if everybody got along. I know people like Alice and Key and Craig Lewis who do these charity projects would love to see all of us get along with each other. Yeah. Make life a lot easier, you know, for a lot of other people doing different events in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, Champs has been around for so long. Like, I, I get what they're doing in a sense. Like I don't, I don't agree with their the business practices of the way that their the dates are and the places that they're going to, et cetera. But they've been around forever. I mean, like when I first started doing this, Champs had been around before, like you know, predated my glass blowing experience. Just you know, being a, the adult industry trade show, and then all of a sudden the pipe industry blew up, and now they're you know a big part of that. But uh, yep. you know, I still I still think the concept of being a glass or a, a gr- quote unquote grassroots type of style trade show is is really the way to be. And I get the big parties and the big excitement and these big fucking whatever you want to hoop de doos. But for me personally, man, that shit is just overwhelming. Like I, I don't want to even walk in those doors just because it's like I walk in there and it's just overstimulation. Never been. <laughs> yeah, I mean neither. And I, any I'm, of the parties, I've never, I've never been to a fucking. Yeah an after party at any of these other yeah and i i don't see myself ever going to it like i'll go to las vegas only because of the way that is you're talking about it being done and the feedback that i've heard the way it's being done and 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 going to vegas in general for me just the energy that place i've never been but it gives me anxiety just thinking about it the whole lamp working thing inside yeah it does if if you get anxiety in large spaces i I definitely experienced anxiety at the champs uh trade show the first time i went and did it i set up with uh Simon Abrams, Chesterfield Glassard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it is, but you got to check it out. You know, if you're going to go to Las Vegas, uh, you got to go in and at least yeah, see it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's dude. There is a whole great community inside there that Maddie White set up with the lamp working, and there's a lot of undiscovered up and coming names mm-hmm. that I see, you know, constantly that I've never heard before uh, that are out there competing. You have a lot of raw material companies, you know, and there's a decent amount of American glass artists that still uh, fend that show. Yeah, you got to go in and check it out. Just fucking ignore it. Yeah, all the other crap. <laughs> you know, pretty much. Put some earbuds in and just walk around. <laughs> I mean, there's like 700 booths, and you probably want to see like 50 of them. Right. Yeah, and those other booths, so they're all selling, like you're saying, grinders and detox and dildos and rolling papers and whatever else t-shirts and you know everything you think yeah that too (laughs) straight up yeah oh yeah there's always one there in the vegas shows yeah he says there isn't but i've seen it with my own eyes the one year i saw it they were doing a fucking giveaway and the chick that you could win was standing right in the booth i was just like this is fucking just unbelievable (laughs) this is where like the this was back uh when they had the world's greatest or like the master's flame off shit you know it was the first time i had ever walked the the trade show floor and he had Slinger with his video booth and Deppy, all these fucking unbelievable artists all there for this competition. It's like, you turn the corner down the aisle, like four booths down, and there was this fucking booth with this dude sitting there, and you put your fucking business card in, and if they draw your card at the end of the day, you win the chick that was sitting in the booth. And I was just like, this this is where it's at, eh? Like, this is hosting this, and that's... I, Man. you know that was one of the that was a big motivating factor for for me to put something I guess a little more for lack of a better word wholesome yeah. together yeah that's a hell of a way though to collect emails huh <laughs> give away a piece of ass for the night <laughs> <laughs> 
But it was like right around the corner from Christian Merwin's <laughs> amazing booth. Yeah, it's so and fucking. Jay from Rolling High was the first time I had ever seen like a whole booth of banjo shit. It was just it huh. blew my mind, you know. And this was like right around the fucking corner. God. So... But then all the other stuff too, and I just thought, how the fuck is this glass in the room with all this other stuff? Like, you know, the head shop is the one unifying factor, mm-hmm. and a lot of these shops that are buying this glass. Are they seriously selling both things? And then come to find out, a lot of them were. You yeah, know, that yeah. there really was no gallery outlets. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, there's a, I've been in the talks with, with Box Fan about doing a whole other podcast for the trade shows, like same kind of format as this one, you know, but just doing it for trade shows. I mean, for the uh, the smoke shops. Because it's kind of these kind of topics are things I want to talk about with the shop owners, and because there's so different, most, so many different personalities, and and just the smoke shop. They're industries. really the voice that's missing in this whole yeah. key. They have no outlet. They have not joined together in any sort of uh, smoke shop association. Yep. And it would be so great to see uh, shops unify and come up with some, you know, regular business standard practice shit, and just have communication amongst each other. You know, I mean, I don't know if that's just ridiculous to hope for or think of, but I mean, man, if if they had a little more of a voice, it would help the artist themselves make what is wanted, necessary, the changes needed to move forward with better business practice. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. And educating the smoke shop owners is gonna would help the industry. I mean, it's just you know, we scratch your back, you scratch ours kind of deal. And that's why I was asking about the trade show things. If the trade shows were potentially hurting the local glass blower because of you know, but but then again, like my area has forty fucking smoke shops in like a five mile radius. You know, <laughs> so there's plenty of smoke shops out there, and it's like it's how- easy to point at the trade shows and just scapegoat the trade shows for just about anything that's negative happening. Yeah. It's easy because there's so many fucked up trade shows. I don't just mean individual companies. I mean individual shows that I've seen happen over the last eight years, just like one show or this show or that show, that just completely destroy multiple people's next six months, you know, like mm. bankrupt the fuck out of them. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah, it's totally. easy to point at the, at the trade shows and just say, you know, with a, with a blanket general you know, fuck those. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't <laughs> want to do. Or but they are the reason. Well, I get it. But I, it, but it is what it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just, like, it's just weird political. I don't know. It's our industry is so weird, and it? it's so fucked up. <laughs> I love it, and I hate it all at the same time. It's like you know, it's it's a it's a dog eat dog world, and it's a battle and a struggle and a fight, and then it's like peaceful and loving and artistic and amazing and beautiful and and then it fucking sucks it's all on who you hang around with <laughs> yeah, yeah it's all absolutely on who you, uh, yep. you know you communicate with and who you allow into your circle and what yeah what man you choose to hang out on yeah dude because i there's so many so many groups i've seen where you get like you get like a group of glass blowers and they're just they're just in it for the money or they're in it so they can buy their drugs or whatever drugs it might be they don't give a shit about the business side of things. They'll go sell their shit for who gives a fuck what it costs them to make it. They'll go sell it for half of what it costs. You know, they'll undersell everybody in the neighborhood. <clears throat> and then you have the other side of it who actually cares about the smoke shop. They care about their glass. They care about the customer at all sides and all facets of what they're doing. And it's like, it's, it's like in the industry. I mean, really out there when it comes down to it. But like you're saying, like if the smoke shops can all get on the same page, which is probably not possible, but who knows? And the glass blowers the same way. Like you're doing these educational talks and stuff. It's you know things that need to be discussed. And th- th- those that go to your trade show are obviously those that take it seriously and want to educate and better themselves. But then there's the ones that maybe can't afford to do that. You know that kind of stuff. It's just it's I don't know. This just seeing this industry that's growing. That's why we. That's why we take trade for booths. You know, and uh, people that have figured it out, uh, they. Some people can only afford to do my show because we take their glass trade Mm -hmm. for the booth. And with the classes, you can do the Kabuki class, which is a two-day demo class. Uh, He's the only one on the torch. There there are no torch spots for uh, students, so the the teacher is the only one that's on the torch at any of this stuff. Um, You've got the Kabuki class teaching general marble information for 400 bucks and there's 12 seats available you've got the bill siegel class uh for 400 bucks and there's 12 seats available and then you've got the slinger class uh who's teaching old school tricks and tips and he named off 10 old school tips and tricks that 
that he's going to cover in uh, two to three hours, or no, two days. You know, so each each trick will be like one to two hours. Right, right. And that's four hundred bucks for four hundred bucks for twelve seats, and we've sold seats to all these classes and we just started announcing it and right now you can go to instagram and until the end of the day tomorrow you can enter in to win a free spot on the seagull class and then the end of the week of the end of this week you can enter in to win the slinger class and i think kabuki must end like the end of next week i don't know i might have it confused but you can win a free seat if you go through the instagram tagging goofy rule shit nice yeah, this actually this episode. We made them really cheap. I was just going to follow up with the reason why we made yeah, the classes yeah. so cheap is we anticipated a lot of people coming from out of state, and I wanted people to be able to afford to travel, pay for a hundred dollar a night hotel room or two hundred bucks or whatever it is that you can find. So we went back and forth. I know these classes are worth six, seven hundred bucks a piece. Yeah, but easily. If I can get all twelve people in at four hundred, <clears throat> that covers. You know, we're not making money. Yeah. <laughs> on, on any of it but it's awesome to get these people there because a lot of them are going to work in our charity demo stuff and donate pieces so it's a win-win you know glass roots would usually cover uh flight and hotel costs for some of these artists anyways to make that kind of thing happen so yeah yeah see yeah what i'm saying they yeah synergistically absolutely. work with each other to do to do the full yeah and again dude that's why you guys have a successful business model because of how you you think about you're not just doing this for the profit. And don't get me wrong, you're a business. You're all about making the profit. I get it. But you're also yeah, all well, about... Yeah, well, the trade show makes the money. The right. trade show makes all of the money. You know, we make some money on kilns. We don't charge admission to any, into anything. You know, Bong Ripper, the last night free show, uh, the Bag of Bong show that J.D. Mapleson will show on our opening night reception is free. I mean, I try and do everything for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is amazing. And it's uh, a rarity <laughs> in this community. <laughs> that anybody's doing anything for free, you know, much less giving up your time. And, and and there are a core group in our community that are given all kinds of time, and which I love to see, you know, the Armadillo Project, the Chicago Projects, all these things going on, and you guys helping out the local charities and communities is fucking amazing. And, and again, that's like the whole other side of this community. There's like the ego centric side of things and then those that don't have ego or they may ha they're, they're confident but they're all about helping out their their fellow brother and sister out there and because yeah, it I find becomes myself successful. Uh, closest to Craig and Allison Craig and Allison right now in the industry I would say and yeah those are the two companies that you and it's neat how we've all helped each other and fed off of each other you know um, I've definitely done my best to support both of those events but you know they both were at my charity event helping me last year mm -hmm. Allison ran the whole uh, silent auction thing on the last night and Craig does all the lamp working for the last seven years at the event awesome that's huge yep. and Craig goes up and helps Allison and Allison goes down and helps Craig I think she was down there by him uh, it, it is fucking cool you know yeah. but it's um small circle <laughs> no no totally but you know man when it comes down to it it's really all you need to be successful is a little small circle that everybody just that circle continues to go in a circle and doesn't go anywhere else it just stays there and everybody works together you know i mean you see your you guys are sponsoring glass vegas who who what other trade show is going to sponsor another fucking trade show <laughs> you know what i mean yeah like we've, it's just, we've, we've got their logo up on our stuff and i'm up on their stuff and yeah, that's that was definitely something i pushed for and wanted leanne to and she's she's fine with all of it. She'll have a double booth um, in our hallway again at the show this year with a a craps table, and you'll be able to shake dice to win small prizes or an artist booth. Um, I know they I think they're going to give away something to a buyer and an artist this year. Neat. But they bring a full fucking like legit craps table with the uh, you know the the fucking service person, so you can go up and right in the hallway going into the show, uh, shake some dice. That's hilarious. That's an awesome way to promote that that trade show. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's all Leanne and Amy right there. Um, you know, and, and to touch back on them briefly, great ladies, excellent business model, extremely trustworthy. That's what I mean. That's it. That's all that should really matter. Yeah. You know, and that's 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 them in a nutshell. So I I see nothing but success for them, uh, and I think eventually they'll stand alone. Um, even though the buyers I know do appreciate being able to go to their show and champs and hopefully champs will see that in the future and acknowledge
acknowledge it that Las Vegas is only bringing to their show, not taking away. You know, yep. that's that's the the fear that everybody has is, oh, what am I going to lose instead of like, what can everybody gain? Yeah, exactly. And it's yeah, yeah, it's. And don't I, get me wrong; it was a tough fucking pill to swallow watching from home. Las Vegas have such success on their first show, <laughs> have more buyers come through than I've been able to pull in eight years. <laughs> but as my wife reminded me, they're in Vegas. And it's just a lot fucking easier to get people to go to Vegas, you know. Yep. And setting it up, you know, on the on the heels of champs, you know, definitely made a lot of sense, and it made a lot of people happy. It really did. Yeah, like I said, I've, the response I've been hearing about it's been incredible. I've, I've I haven't heard anything negative about that trade show. Which is unheard of. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, give it, give it another year. Dude. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't find something wrong with it. <laughs> You're fucking it. But yeah, I mean that's so. So I just wanted to make sure I got that back in there. That um, yeah, you know, it's 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 something that I do support and do continue to send people to. And uh, anytime I can make introductions for artists that are curious i always send them over and give the you know the little quick hello here's you know the or amy type of thing yeah you know i wonder too with the vegas thing if it works so well for them because vegas has their packages you know like the hotel flight packages and all that kind of stuff compared to it works you know, yeah not only that you can get 99 dollars flights you can get cheap fuck but fuck the packages yeah these owners a lot of them like to gamble yeah it's true Okay, I mean, just flat out, they like to gamble. They get to go to Vegas and leave their family and their wife and their kids at home, and they're going to fucking Vegas for a business trip, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying everybody doesn't treat it that way, you know, but you do have, uh, you know, a lot of gamblers, I'm sure, or people that just want to go to the fucking strip joint. Yep. Whatever it is, you know, eat good food. So it's, it's a split, you know. I mean, you see the trade shows pretty fucking empty, you know, before the shows are done. You know, a couple hours before, it's usually just dinner and get the fuck out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody's energy gets refocused into other things, extracurricular activities. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the city's open, you know, 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. Which makes it substantially different than uh, doing it in any city other than Las Vegas. Oh, yeah. Hey, Nick, give me one second real quick, bro. Hold on one second. Yo, yo, dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. But uh, yeah, man, and, and I think too what I like about the fact that you guys are in Madison is it's like, sure, there's a lot of cool places to go eat and drink and stuff, but there's not that that dangling carrot of gambling and strip clubs and stuff out there to go and potentially blow all your money that you just made, you know? No, you're in a real town, downtown, with. I mean, they, they, you know, it's not a neighborhood you're in, but you can walk a half a mile up the water and you're in the Willie Street neighborhood. So you're you're a mile from a co-op. You're within the square mile away from the water. I'm going to guess there's like 300 places to eat. You know, the campus is right up State Street. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I mean, people that don't know what they're getting into and they get there for the first time and they, they're, they're willing to go explore and walk around, they're usually pretty fucking impressed. It's a fun town to spend a couple of days in, especially if you like to drink and eat. If you're not into booze, then there's plenty of other shit for you to find to do, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. Definitely a, a forward-thinking city. Yeah, I'm looking forward, man. This year, I'm definitely there. I got my time off work already, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting up and exploring the town and just going out back and seeing that lake. You know, just like everything I've heard about the place is just incredible. Not to mention the building that it's in, you know? Yep, Frank Lloyd right building and it is on like the they built they they had to you know fill in i don't know how much water with sand to put the first pillars down but i mean the where where you're standing on the trade show floor there's water underneath you no shit you never know it huh. yeah so it goes way underneath the building that's how frank had it designed in his head yep wild and how old is that building do you know 20 years 21 years old. Okay. They just had their 20 year anniversary, I think, this past week. Neat. Huh. Yeah, I can't wait to see it, bro. I'm excited. Not to mention just get the fuck out of Florida and <laughs> get into it's a little bit cooler weather. Man, it's been 95 here every day with 10,000% humidity for the last month and a half. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. 
for sure. There's something what else. other things you got on that list that you'd like to speak about? Yeah, so I was trying to look at here. I don't know. I think that was like the main points I wanted to make sure we covered. I don't. Do you have any uh, any of your own opinions? Oh, you know, I know what it was. Talking about like, I, I guess we kind of covered a little bit, but it was you know the first time, the first time glassblower coming in, you know, to kind of not to go over all the details on how to run a trade show or you know successfully sell your work, but you know when you're coming in as a new guy or gal coming in to sell your work, do you recommend that they come in, you know, the cash and carry concept and have samples? Like, should you have like? A nice variety of stuff where you have your samples that you can get orders on and then your cash and carry stuff or do you think coming in at first you should kind of like just kind of ease in with a little bit of product so you're not getting overwhelmed from orders like what do you what that's, do you, you that's know? i would i would definitely if this is your i mean if you're going to do a trade show and it's your first time you've ever done a trade show i hope that you looked up bruce baker you've looked at youtube videos uh you've went to other trade shows you've looked at pictures of what trade show booths look like on instagram and facebook and you've set your booth up in your own garage or basement taking if you're in a 10 by 10 a yellow piece of tape or whatever the fuck you got mark out your 10 by 10 and set your booth up and you should be able to do it pretty much you know like clockwork your stuff should all come out and it knows where it's going to go. I mean, so many people I see setting up on the the whole setup day, and you can tell it, they have no fucking idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, like, just made their glass. And, you know, that's if you can make it work, you can make it work. But, I mean, in my mind, your stuff should all be priced. You should have catalogs printed or a sell sheet of your individual one-offs. Make it as easy on the buyer as humanly possible because they're overwhelmed as it is they're looking at shit in all directions and you just need to keep their attention for 10 minutes right five minutes 10 yeah. minutes so if you can just hand them something that says this is everything i have this is who i am then maybe they'll keep and go home with it too you know if you don't make the sale mm-hmm. right there at the point of purchase or however you want to say it yeah 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 including like you know being able to take credit cards be able to take cash have a you know a little small bank like do you guys do you guys offer the ability to like get change that kind of stuff no there's i'm gonna bet very little cash is spent on any production okay. at the show okay i'm gonna say that the cash is spent on the high high end the one-offs um and then if you're buying out somebody's booth or you make i mean you know some people come in with wads of cash but i mean most people are coming in with checks yeah or credit card and a lot of people are placing orders more and more so i'm seeing midwest shop owners or people that are just intelligent enough to bring a big van on the last day just walking out with bins and tubs of shit on wednesday and you just wait you know and find the sad faces or the people with a lot of stuff left on their table and cut them checks you know and i'm not saying that that's the the greatest profit margin but to answer your question about bringing stuff in if you don't know that you're capable of either driving home and making sales on the way home or you haven't done the show before to prove that you can do inventory off your table beyond you know just regular because most people that are going to purchase from you at the show are still going to expect you to mail it so why bring it with you yeah you get what I'm saying? Yep. If you got to fucking go to the FedEx or the post office to mail the box within 24 to 48 hours, well, you just cause your, you know, you should just have it at home. So if you can't get the people to leave with it, you're just making more work for yourself. Right, exactly. Unless if you plan that day out in the hotel and you're like, okay, I'm going to spend this day doing these things to get the stuff out in Madison before I leave. Do you think then like something like that per se, like putting together a package, like a, you know, a $500 package or a thousand dollar package. And this is the kind of pipes Best you get. Best thing you can do. You know? Yeah. Best okay. thing you can do. If you've got a catalog that is uh, multifaceted, they, you just, you, if they're into your work, you want to be able to just look them in the eyes and say, I have a $500 package that I can give to your store. And if they have five stores, they're going to ask for five packages. Exactly. And that's how right? I've always sold myself. And then each of their store managers, they're going to open it up and see what sells and doesn't sell if yep. they have a good system and it's going to get put into their POS and then they're going to figure out what sold and didn't sell. But this is all banking on shops being able to reorder properly. Yep. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's what I do myself. Like when I go to a new store or get new customers through social media or whatever, I have like a three hundred dollar introductory package, and it's not a lot of money, but it's a cheap package for a shop to get a little bit of my glass and then they like you're saying they can figure out what's going to sell best what the customer response is going to be from it because there's so many different variables that have come in besides you just selling your work on all ends of the spectrum from the customer to the shop owners to the customer's friends that are just going to smoke this shit and they may come back and want to buy it or you know there's all kind of things so it's i'm glad we covered this because it's it's uh it's easy to get overwhelmed and it's also easy to do this in a simplified format to where you're not stressing yourself out and you're having a good time. So important. Cause like I was saying before with Chris, like he goes there and he gets like huge orders that they were not expecting to get. And then he has to figure out how the fuck they're going to get them all made. And then going through that process of making the orders, then he learns how to properly schedule his time and how to make priorities on certain shops. Who ordered first, who ordered last. You know, like, do you recommend, like, for instance, I've always questioned whether you should get a deposit on an order, or should you just trust the fact that this shop owner is going to remember who you are, that they wrote this order? Yeah, I mean, that's you know? that's a that you know, in a perfect world, you should get a deposit in our industry because there is so much fucked up, and that's where, like, if you belong to said thing and you were approved or accredited or whatever it is, then these shops would be, you know, they would be able to move comfortably forward giving mm -hmm. you a deposit. Yep. You get what I'm saying? Oh, but yeah. there is no check and balance. So who the fuck wants to give this new person their credit card info or 50% down when they have no idea if they're going to go home and really send this out or not? Yeah, so exactly. that's why getting your foot in the door and showing that you can do good business is the, you people will spend more money to do good business with people for mm -hmm. the most part. You know, yeah. I, I believe that to be true. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad we covered that, man, for sure. Because I think the idea, is like, it's like again, just to have a spreadsheet out that has all your shit you're making, put together some packages, some introductory packages of samples and whatever, whether it's like some onesies and pennants and spoons and etc. You know, just really fine tune and figure out what the fuck it is you're doing. Because and, and a lot of like like other shows, art shows and stuff, they require that you send a picture of your booth of all your photographs of the stuff you're going to sell, etc. because they don't want some amateur just going to come in there and be a sore thumb that's going to be in the middle of the uh, of their trade show. Because that's yeah, all it takes, see, man. Yeah, I, I decided to take the, the route of... <clears throat> you got to teach somehow, right? And the only way for some of these folks to get better is to get in the room with other people. And I'm not even saying I could have filled a trade show room with that type of uh, juried selection but how do people get better if they you know you don't give them an opportunity to get in a room around their peers you know mm -hmm. that's that's sort of how i look at it and i got to say something real quick about something i don't think is done nearly enough business cards are great mm -hmm. handing catalogs out are great all that kind of shit but if you know that your chillum or your spoon or whatever i'm not saying you can hand out a bunch of fucking rigs but the best thing that you can hand a shop owner that you want to do business with is the item you want them to purchase. Mm -hmm. So if they don't do an order with you, but you've got a box full of these spoons that you know are your bread and butter, give them a spoon or two. Let them go home, show their employees or whoever their buyer is or whatever the deal is. You get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I do. Put the I product in their hands. And Absolutely. I never see it. I mean, maybe I'm missing it. But I just don't ever hear about it. Or I mean, that's that would be my number one business ploy or tactic. Yeah, I could completely put agree. Put the shit in people's hands. Yep. No, yeah, I did a whole episode on selling to like new territories. Like if you've never been somewhere before, or you moved, and that's one of the best things you can do is go introduce yourself. Don't like I, I always say, go to the smoke shops first, do some recon, figure out what they're selling shit for, do some math in your head to figure out potentially what the wholesale numbers are. Don't let them know you're a glass blower go incognito and then come back with a catalog sheet or some samples that you can just give to whether it's the employee, if it's an employee worker and the shop owner's out there, give them two samples so they can give one of the samples, hopefully give the other sample to the shop owner, whether it's a pendant or a spoon or whatever. It makes a huge difference for them to physically have their your glass in their hand and they're going to remember well, they you. they might start using it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm saying to give it to them at the trade shows. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying just in terms of like what what you're saying about instead of giving them a business card because 
everybody hands out business cards and I know how many times I've gone to art shows and grabbed business cards and then I'm going through my pocket like what's all this shit in my pocket and next thing I know I'm throwing them away but if you have a well, piece of yeah, you know you just got 500 of them that, yeah. that is correct yeah but if you have a piece of glass you're not going you're gonna, you're like oh oh shit I had this pipe from this and then even like have your name sand blasted on it and you know or like a website or your Instagram tag like at whatever on you know it's it's so easy nowadays just to go to have things like that done it's not a problem i mean i understand there's a cost to it but i th- i look at the trade shows and that doing art shows as you're paying to go someplace to advertise yourself you're putting yourself out in the it. forefront you're getting your face exposed you're shaking hands kissing babies building relationships and you're paying you're basically paying an advertising fee to go and have a little small infomercial for yourself you know billy mays here fucking we're buying you know blah 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 here's all my shit you know sell your shit but you're going there so people see your face, they recognize who you are with your glass, they put a name with your glass, and then hand them a sample. And again, if you can sandblast your Instagram name on there or a tag or whatever. But another thing too, man, I've seen, which I love with technology, is there's business cards nowadays that are like a small little flash drive or a little little mini disc that you can stick in your laptop and next thing you know, you can upload the person's entire catalog off their business card. Yep, you know? they definitely exist. It's, shit's cool, they're expensive, but... You know, if you do the math and it's like six in one hand, half a dozen in the other, it's like, okay, how are we going to go about doing this? You know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and for a rookie coming into a trade show, it can be scary and overwhelming and confusing and then fun, hopefully, all at the same time. <laughs> That's why I recommend just attending a couple first. Yeah. Really get the feel and the vibe and the understanding and make sure you set your booth up. Yeah. Before you come to a trade show, yeah, absolutely. And that's I'm doing. I'm doing the Renaissance Festival. Like that was part of my quote unquote apprenticeship when I started doing my glass. And part of what I had to do was help them set these fucking giant circus tents up in the backyard, just to go through the process of helping them set the tent up. So I had to learn how to set this thing up. I've seen people go to shows that they've never set their fucking tent up before. They don't even know how to set the tent up. <laughs> you know, it's it's ridiculous or you're closing the tent and you get your hands pinched in it because everything kind of folds up into itself and if you've done that several times and practice it you're not going to hurt yourself closing your booth up you know? <laughs> just those little silly things that people just don't think about and there's so many little things that you may forget receipt books extra papers business cards pens clips staples i mean there's like all these little small things that you just don't know until you go and fucking do it and everybody's like, oh, I think I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, dude, quit fucking thinking and just go do it. Go do it. Go spend the Will, thousand Will dollars. Menzie, Will Menzie turned me on to the guy, Bruce Baker. Mm-hmm. That's that's like the, the trade show booth guru. Yeah, he mentioned that when him and I talked on the show last time. I'm actually writing that name down right now. It's some dry, boring shit, but you can buy his DVD for like 10 bucks and... I have listened to it, and I know most people probably aren't going to take the time, but damn, if you YouTube it, buy it, whatever, look at it. I mean, he just beats it into your head over and over again. Buyers do not want to bend over. Bring it to eye level. Use good lighting. Put your shit on individual little boxes. Don't put clutter. You know, I mean, certain clutter makes sense as long as it's appealing and uniformed to the eye. Yeah, exactly. I think the worst thing I've seen is when someone has a tie-dyed cover on their table and then all their pipes on the table, and then they the pipes get lost in the fucking tie dye. I got I got David Brooks last year, at the end of his uh, first or second day, I could tell he was bummed out, not doing what he usually does, and I uh, I had him move some glass a different direction, and then take a black cloth and put it down. Mm-hmm. They did they like they, they tripled. What it's they a, had done. I mean, it's all chicks. Black cloth, fucking yeah. black cloth. If yeah. you if you're not bringing black cloth or the proper you might as well just not even. I mean, it's, we've talked about making it mandatory, but the shit's expensive for us to just buy rolls of it and fucking hand out. So we just try and tell people, you know, and most people know now, especially if you have fume or clear work, mm-hmm. if you don't have a black fucking cloth down. You're, you're gonna struggle, <laughs> dude. The cheapest thing you can do is go to like Michaels and go buy a roll of parchment paper, like the black parchment paper, and just put paper down and and clip that shit under your tabletop. Nobody will even know it's as yep. long as it's tight. They'll never know it's fucking paper. And then you can take a nope. silver Sharpie marker. You can write with a Sharpie. We can write your names, your prices, your catalog numbers on the actual paper. It's like going to any kind of restaurant that has like a white parchment paper fucking tablecloth and you're done eating. They rip oh, yeah, it off. And, it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, 
but yep. it'll, I, I know you do, but those listening to the show may not think about it. <laughs> so that's why no, I mean, you know, I, I, up, I, it's, uh, it's the, the parchment paper thing. I think, you know, um, just getting them to put anything black down yeah. is, uh, that is a good call, you know, the whole fucking roll. I had never considered that instead of doing the, the flimsy cloth because you can write right on it. I'm going to use that. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I just, honestly, that just came to my head here, so I'm glad I'm glad you'd like it. <laughs> so that's how I usually work. I think out loud here. But, you know, too, like part of, like right now with uh, with my gig at the Mouse House, um, one of my new characters I'm going to be doing is Figment, and I'm using the Chinese Amethyst purple to make them and it's a cfl color so i'm trying to talk uh, the owners to do a little display for them that has two different types of lights in there that can kind of alternate and show how the colors change in the glass and something my brother you know that, what i'm bringing this up is when my brother and i were doing the pen and palooza he was more prepared than i was and he's only been in the in this industry for i think seven years now something like that but the way he thinks, he thinks I, I get influenced from him because of how he does things. And he had a fucking black light flashlight. And it was right when the the, the uh, UV colors were getting hyped up. And he's like, people are walking by his, his pendants and they're loving his work. And he's like, hey, check this shit out. And he like hits it with a black light. And everybody's like, I want five of those. You know, and it's like, you got to be prepared with that kind of stuff. You know, have a little box with batteries and backup black light flashlights that you can have. I mean, fuck, if anything, go to Amazon and buy 50 of them and put your name on those things and give those away. You know what I mean? Like, just something little simple mm-hmm. things. Or just the whole, with the CFL colors, because it's like some some environments, the light is all the same, so you can't see that this is actually a real CFL. So you need to figure out potentially what type of lighting the place is going to have so you can bring the opposite spectrum so then you can make your piece change colors based on the CFLs. You know, it's just little, little, it, you know, little things like that just make such a big difference in terms of selling your work. It's huge. You know, we can't all have Vanna White standing there selling our shit for us. <laughs> <laughs> as much as that'd be nice. I mean, shit, dude, I like that idea with the business card and the hooker in the backstage thing. I mean, shit. I would never do that, but it's, that's, I, that shit still cracks me up. <laughs> the fuck? Oh, man, it's so crazy. It's like, come win a free cruise. And next thing you know, you got HIV. Oh, it's just silly. So I'm going off here on a tangent. <laughs> but yeah, so it's just things to think about. You know, there's all kind of ways you can go about doing the trade shows. And again, you guys are killing it, helping out this community and influencing other trade shows. And whether or not these big boys out there are going to keep fighting and trying to, quote unquote, put you guys out of business, I don't see you all going anywhere anytime soon, man. So keep it up, brother. Thank you. I will. Yeah, one more thing I want to ask you real quick too, before I forget, was uh, I know you're doing the the panel, quote unquote, panel group discussion. You know, with the different the different people coming in. Um, have you thought about doing like a panel of like discussion panel with like you know a, a lineup on a stage and having an audience to be able to ask questions about certain things? You know, like bringing in like a lawyer talking about laws and stuff, and you know different different areas of that accounting business. You know that kind of stuff too. Besides just focusing on the, yep. the glass stuff yep think about it i mean that's kind of what we did with the two or the three conversation classes last year uh germ did one but his was fo- focused mainly on the cranes uh mm-hmm. tito did one that was focused on operation pipe dreams but people got to ask questions and there was a bunch of different neat interviews done during that um <clears throat> and then carmen lozar did one it was more of a q a but she definitely uh spoke to people about how to pursue your vision as an artist uh, but we talk about it all the time, and it's it's really just the thing that always falls short uh, because of time, energy, and when to do it, what the appropriate time to do it is. But I, I have put on uh, successful panels in the past, you know, with large groups of people. Uh, just didn't do it again this year. Yeah. Me and Phil Siegel talked a lot about it, doing it, and having him kabuki. And uh, I going to ask Carmen to speak about collectors and we had a few topics we were going to talk about but once again just got put to the back burner yeah and i can see like you're saying before we talked about with the classes how they they're at the same time as the trade shows so it's just just the nuance of trying to figure out how to balance that maybe just do like you're saying do a whole separate event 
that's strictly just an informative event and not a trade show where you're selling your stuff. Because you could do it with that same event. You could you can link it with the trade show, but it's okay. This is how you successfully set up a booth or how, you know, quote unquote successfully. Everybody's different, but, you know, kind of teaching that. At, I mean, maybe bring Bruce Baker in as one of the talks, you know, type of thing. But do a whole separate event just as a side niche kind of gimmick. I think it would work. It's just figuring out when to when to do it because <laughs> every other trade show out there is always going on. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you know, <laughs> God. And then where do you put it? You know, do you keep it in Madison? Do you go some? Do you go to Vegas with it? Do you go you know come to Florida with that kind of thing? Like you know, it's like okay, where do you go with that? So it's yeah, you guys have your hands full, and you only have one trade show. So yep, keep it up. Absolutely, man. Well, anything else, brother, you want to say before we uh, get off here and off the air? No. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, give a, a plug about the trade show and discuss current happenings. Hell yeah. If you want to repeat one more time, too, the uh, the giveaways you guys are doing for the, the classes. Um, the Phil Siegel class giveaway ends, and it's really easy. All you have to do is just take a friend in glass suits, uh, copy it on your Instagram page. Um, the Phil Siegel one ends tomorrow and I think it might be Kabuki actually that ends next and I think that's Friday and then I don't know they end like three days apart each of them runs for a week that you have time to tag someone in but it's a chance to win a free spot and each of the you can enter into all three of them as well of the class giveaways hell yeah yeah and I'll have that link in the show notes and I'll also repost it on my Instagram too to, to help promote that as well for you guys all right. Be killer. Yeah, man. Well, hang on. Just uh, we'll say our goodbyes off the air real quick. So. Uh, sure. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, yeah, man, for sure. So thanks again, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, those that are going to Glassroots, I will see you there. Uh, we're gonna be talking about setting up some interviews and stuff. So uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit further as we get closer to October. But uh, definitely think about what you're doing before you go sign up for trade shows, because it isn't just going and setting up your stuff and, and selling your glass. There's a lot of little nuances that are involved. Get yourself organized. Make lists and check them twice like fucking Santa Claus because if you don't you're going to go there and be really frustrated and end up blaming the trade show for your lack of success when it really it's it's all about you and uh, that's what it comes down to so be smart and be prepared and until next time we will talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show y'all take it easy peace this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Glassroots Art Show now entering its ninth year, Glassroots is designed for artists and distributors who wish to do wholesale business with shops and galleries. Located at the Monona Terrace Convention Center on beautiful Lake Monona in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, the art show features at least 25 glass workers demonstrating and creating pieces for public viewing, live and silent auctions, raffles, and approximately 40 booths consisting of raw material supplies, functional and non-functional art, and glass charitable organizations. This year, in 2017, Glassroots will be held October 9th through the 11th. And for any more information, just go to glassrootsartshow.com. That's glassrootsartshow.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lampworking community. This has been accomplished by developing relationships with the finest artists and sharing their techniques with you through in-depth, step-by-step tutorials. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glasscraft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.